the Node.js community is about to get flipped on its head because on May 13th, Dino the dinosaur is coming. Now there's been a lot of confusion around whether Dino is actually a dinosaur or something else like a Loch Ness monster. And I'm here to tell you first that he's obviously a dinosaur. If you see the Loch Ness monster, he is dark, he is black, and Dino is white. Dino is definitely a dinosaur, right? So I just wanted to clear that up before we get started. So I know half of you have no idea what the heck I'm talking about. So we're going to start off with just a quick intro into what Dino actually is. And then we're gonna get into the juicier part where we're gonna talk about what I actually think about Dino and the effects it's gonna have on the Node.js community. All right, so Dino is a secure runtime for both TypeScript and JavaScript, but I kind of just like to think of it as Node.js with some different rules. And the guy that made Node.js, Ryan Dahl, also is making Dino. And the idea was he made Node.js, but as he made that code and the design decisions on how he structured everything was from a long time ago. And so when he looks back on it now, he's like, ugh, my code is disgusting. And that makes sense. That happens to every single programmer. But the problem is, not every programmer has their code run on like 12 million people's computers every day. And so the problem now is he can't really fix Node.js because they all rely on legacy, compatibility, et cetera, et cetera. So what he's doing instead is he's creating a whole new thing with like all the bright things and you know improvements that he learned that he wished he could put in Node. So that's some context for you. Now let's get into Node.js and Dino. What are the differences or at least some of the big ones? So the first thing is Dino is secure by default. And what that means in practice is if I run a Dino program, it's not gonna have any permissions by default. And so when I run something that tries to access say the network or my file system that's going to error out unless I explicitly give it permission by passing in a flag to the CLI. Compare this with Node where if I just run a Node program it can do whatever it wants and it has permissions to do everything. This is important because a lot of times you're not actually running just your own code. If you install an NPM package or running a CLI from somewhere else you didn't write that code, you don't know what's in that code so theoretically it could do anything it wants on your computer. And so Dino restricts that and so is secure. Next, the way Dino decided to build its API for kind of the standard functions that you use is they try to be compatible with the browser. And so they have things like fetch and set interval and set timeout and a whole bunch of other stuff that is actually from the browser and that works the same way as the browser. The nice thing about this is now if you know the browser functions and are a front end engineer, a lot of your knowledge carries over to Dino and you can use that. And vice versa, if I know Dino and the functions involved in that, I can use those in the browser and so you can share knowledge back and forth, which is just very convenient. Next, they have a ton of stuff that is just built into Dino and they have standards. So just to name a few of them, they have a test runner, they have a file watcher, they have a bundler, and there's a ton of other stuff that they just have baked in. And so you have no daemon and jest and webpack just kind of mashed in there. And you don't have to install all these different tools to get your code working. There's two advantages to this approach. One, everyone's gonna be using the same tooling. So if I'm using Dino and you're using Dino, we're both using the same bundler. And then secondly, usually these tools will integrate nicely together. Sometimes when we have two unrelated tools that we need to mesh in the same ecosystem, it gets a little ugly. But theoretically, if Dino knows about the bundler and the file watcher, it can do things that mesh together quite nicely. And the biggest change of all is they're getting rid of node modules, package JSON, and NPM. So if you wanna use somebody else's code, you no longer use those things. Instead, they put their code on a place that just serves files, and then in Dino, you just say, I wanna to import to this URL, and you can just import code directly from a URL now. And the rationale behind this is, number one, node modules and package.json, the entire thing is one, bloated, right? There's a bunch of other stuff in package.json besides just your dependencies. And secondly, that whole abstraction is quite unnecessary. And in addition to that, we're using NPM as a central place where we all download packages. So the idea is now I can just point to really any server that hosts a file and I can use that for my code. Also related to this, when you import from URLs or from just local files, you need to now include the file extension. So in Node right now, you can just leave that off or you can do stuff like not include the word slash index at the end and it will infer these things. So now they're getting rid of that and the idea behind that is it's very ambiguous. You don't know if they meant slash index.js 
or maybe you went .tsx. All these extensions that the resolver has to guess on basically, it's just gone. We know exactly what file you mean to reference. And there's a bunch of other stuff that Dino does, but these are the major points. And I didn't wanna make this too much an introduction or a comprehensive one anyway into Dino because there's a lot to it. And go check out dino.land if you're more interested in that stuff. Because what I wanna to get to is kind of my thoughts on it and what this means for Node.js. Okay, so I'm actually quite surprised after learning more about Dino that for myself, when I'm looking at what it offers, I'm kind of indifferent for a lot of the things. Like, don't get me wrong, like, I think they're very positive, but at the same time, in the current system of how Node.js works, I'm not suffering too bad. Like, if I was going to rate my developer experience with Node.js, maybe I give it, like, somewhere around here, right? And when I heard about Dino, I was like, wow, that sounds kind of life changing. And there was so much hype around it. I felt like Dino was gonna be like this for the developer experience. But then when I learned more about it and everything it had to offer, I actually kind of got like less excited about it. And I kind of feel like Node.js is here and Dino is like here. It's a step up from Node, but it doesn't feel like a giant leap ahead. And I think one of the main reasons I'm feeling this way is there's not like a super sexy feature to flex or show off to my friends who are still using Node.js. Like, what am I supposed to do? And I'm supposed to be like, yo, bro, you see that import statement? Yeah, you jelly? That has a file extension at the end. Zero ambiguity. No, he's just gonna look at me and be like, uh, so? <laughs> I don't, what? And I don't think this would be a big deal. I don't think you always need like sexy features. If I could just swap Node out for Dino, if it was just a swap, easy to do thing, then yeah, I'm fine with that. But the problem is I think there's going to be a lot of friction with the way that Dino handles third-party modules. There are a ton of NPM packages right now which are incompatible with Dino for one reason or another. Either they're using require syntax and module.exports or they're using a patch.json file to handle dependencies and they're not including file extensions when they're importing stuff or they're just using an API or a function that is specific to Node.js and because they don't work in Dino, because Dino is not supporting that right now, it's kind of awkward. Now it does sound like there are some workarounds to get some existing NPM packages to work in Dino. So one of these things is called JSPM, and that'll allow you to convert common JS format into ESM, which will work better with Dino. But the thing is, as a developer, I don't wanna care about these things. Like I don't wanna go look up my package and see, hmm, my package is not compatible with Dino because of X, Y, and Z reasons. So in that case, I need to go use this workaround to get it to work. I don't wanna even think about that stuff. Instead, Dino should just handle all this stuff for me. Like, especially because they like built-in tooling, they should have a tool where I can tell it, hey, I want this NPM package, or I wanna use this in my code. And then what it'll do is it'll try converting automatically the entire tree of dependencies. Because remember, it's not just that package that I need like switched over to Dino. I need all of its dependencies switched over to Dino as well. So the tool will try to do that and underneath the hood, it can do whatever it wants to try to figure out what workarounds it needs to get it to work with Dino's module system. And I don't even have to think about that stuff. And maybe in some cases, it's not possible to automatically do this sort of thing. And no, that's totally fine. Just throw an error like, hey, sorry, we can automatically handle this. In those cases, then we're gonna have to just manually port over those libraries, which again, kind of sucks. I don't know how many cases this is gonna come up for, but like, we have the exact same language and it feels like we're just taking the exact same code and then just like switching up a few imports to get it to work. It just feels weird to have to do that. I'm thinking the NPM packages that just have nothing to do with Node.js are gonna be the easiest to automatically switch over and make it compatible with Dino right now. But the ones that need Node.js APIs or functions are gonna be a little bit harder because right now Dino does not have compatibility with Node. So when that comes, because they are working on it, then I think it'll be very possible to have packages that work in both Node.js and Dino and people don't need to think about that sort of thing. I think that is the ideal future where I can just write an NPM package and I don't have to think whether this is gonna be used in Node or if it's gonna be used in Dino. Now I did see a project with similar intentions called Denoify and it was more aimed at library authors though where you could make your NPM package compatible with Dino but I'm not really a fan of that approach because I think it'll cause a lot of churn in the Node.js ecosystem if all these library authors now have to start supporting Dino as well as like an output. 
Instead, I think it'd be really nice if Dino can handle that and Dino just like sucks in the NPM package and then handles it. And I just have no idea what's gonna happen with these Node.js packages, which are not written necessarily in JavaScript. They're written in C++, like for example, the Sharp library, which you can handle images. I really like this one. I use this in my projects. I'm not really sure how this works in a Dino world, if it's easy to pull that in or if they're gonna have to do a lot of work on the library author's end to get this to work with Dino. So I'm not sure if we're just gonna lose these things and they're gonna need to be re-implemented in Dino land. But either way, there's just not that many NPM packages like that. So if Dino can make it dead simple for developers to include like 90% of NPM packages, I think Dino is gonna get real popular. But as things stand, I think Dino is gonna have some trouble just converting people over from Node.js. Like here's what I imagine happening. So you go up to your boss and you're like, hey, can we use Dino for our next project? And he's gonna be like, hmm. Tell me more about this. Why should we uh, use this? And then you inform him that it's going to be more secure and we can kind of set the permissions that our program runs under. In which case he counters by saying, you know what, for this project, we're just going to turn on all permissions anyway. You then inform him that it has a much nicer API and is compatible with the browser. Your boss looks at you and then says, hmm what's an API? At this point, you're kind of regretting opening your mouth, but either way, you trudge through and try your best to explain it to him. Needless to say, he doesn't quite get convinced that it's all that important. So you go on to tell him about the module system in Dino and let him know that all you have to do is point at a URL to get other people's code. There is no unnecessary abstraction, and I also can put file extensions. That way there is zero ambiguity. Your boss replies, hmm, those URLs and file extensions just kind of look ugly in the imports. And how does this help our KPIs? At this point, you know you've blundered and you're about to be put in checkmate as soon as you tell him about how you actually need to port over some modules just to get them compatible with Dino. Instead of giving your boss a checkmate, you surrender, you don't give him that satisfaction and you just grudgingly tell him that, yeah, Node.js is gonna be fine for the next project. Unfortunately for you, your boss wasn't very happy with your attitude, and next thing you know, you're being placed on a legacy Angular code base, and this leads to a spiraling, deep depression, and eventually you just become a carrot farmer. But this is just my two cents on Dino. I think it has a ton of potential and I am sure the internals of Dino are just like a thousand times cleaner and better than Node. And with some right decisions from the Dino team, I see it replacing a lot of Node.js usage. Now for myself, until Dino has kind of some stuff in place that'll automatically handle NPM modules and I don't even have to worry or think or sweat about these sort of things, I'm not really gonna migrate anything over to Dino or spend too much time with it. I do think it's gonna be kinda nice to build like one-off utilities or little scripts. I think it's just gonna be a nicer environment than Node. But other than that, that is kind of how I plan to use Dino for the time being.